Over the course of some 14 centuries, the Romans and other peoples of Italy employed a system of nomenclature that differed from that used by other cultures of Europe and the Mediterranean, consisting of a combination of personal and family names. Although conventionally referred to as the tria nomina, the combination of prenomen, nomen, and cognomen that have come to be regarded as the basic elements of the Roman name in fact represent a continuous process of development. From at least the 7th century BC to the end of the 7th century AD, the names developed as part of this system became a defining characteristic of Roman civilization, and although the system itself vanished during the early Middle Ages, the names themselves exerted a profound influence on the development of European naming practices, and many Many continue to survive in modern languages. Topic Overview: The distinguishing feature of Roman nomenclature was the use of both personal names and regular surnames. Throughout Europe and the Mediterranean, other ancient civilizations distinguished individuals through the use of single personal names, usually dithematic in nature, consisting of two distinct elements or themes. These names allowed for hundreds or even thousands of possible combinations. But a markedly different system of nomenclature arose in Italy, where the personal name was joined by a hereditary surname. Over time, this binomial system expanded to include additional names and designations. The most important of these names was the nomen gentilicium, or simply nomen, a hereditary surname that identified a person as a member of a distinct gens. This was preceded by the prenomen, or forename a personal name that served to distinguish between the different members of a family. The origin of this binomial system is lost in prehistory, but it appears to have been established in Latium and Etruria by at least 650 BC. In written form, the nomen was usually followed by affiliation, indicating the personal name of an individual's father, and sometimes the name of the mother or other antecedents. Toward the end of the Roman Republic, this was followed by the name of a citizen's voting tribe. Lastly, these elements could be followed by additional surnames, or cognomena, which could be either personal or hereditary, or a combination of both. The Roman grammarians came to regard the combination of prenomen, nomen, and cognomen as a defining characteristic of Roman citizenship, known as the tria nomina. However, although all three elements of the Roman name existed throughout most of Roman history, the concept of the tria nomina can be misleading, because not all of these names were required or used throughout the whole of Roman history. During the period of the Roman Republic, the prenomen and nomen represented the essential elements of the name. The cognomen first appeared among the Roman aristocracy at the inception of the Republic, but was not widely used among the plebeians, who made up the majority of the Roman people, until the 2nd century BC. Even then, not all Roman citizens bore cognomena, and until the end of the Republic, the cognomen was regarded as somewhat less than an official name. By contrast, in imperial times the cognomen became the principal distinguishing element of the Roman name, and although prenomena never completely vanished, the essential elements of the Roman name from the 2nd century onward were the nomen and cognomen. Naming conventions for women also varied from the classical concept of the tria nomina. Originally Roman women shared the binomial nomenclature of men, but over time the prenomen became less useful as a distinguishing element, and women's prenomena were gradually discarded, or replaced by informal names. By the end of the Republic, the majority of Roman women either did not have or did not use prenomena. Most women were called by their nomen alone, or by a combination of nomen and cognomen. Prenomena could still be given when necessary, and as with men's prenomena the practice survived well into imperial times, but the proliferation of personal cognomena eventually rendered women's prenomena obsolete. In the later empire, members of the Roman aristocracy used several different schemes of assuming and inheriting nomina and cognomena, both to signify their rank, and to indicate their family and social connections. Some Romans came to be known by alternative names, or signia, and due to the lack of surviving epigraphic evidence, the full nomenclature of most Romans, even among the aristocracy, is seldom recorded. Thus, although the three types of names referred to as the tria nomina existed throughout Roman history, the period during which the majority of citizens possessed exactly three names was relatively brief. Nevertheless, because most of the important individuals during the best recorded periods of Roman history possessed all three names, the tria nomina remains the most familiar conception of the Roman name. For a variety of reasons, the Roman nomenclature system broke down in the centuries following the collapse of imperial authority in the West. 
the prenomen had already become scarce in written sources during the 4th century, and by the 5th century it was retained only by the most conservative elements of the old Roman aristocracy. Over the course of the 6th century, as Roman institutions and social structures gradually fell away, the need to distinguish between nomina and cognomina likewise vanished. By the end of the 7th century, the people of Italy and Western Europe had reverted to single names. But many of the names that had originated as part of the tria nomina were adapted to this usage, and survived into modern times. <inaudible> Origin and development As in other cultures, the early peoples of Italy probably used a single name, which later developed into the prenomen. Marcus Terentius Varro wrote that the earliest Italians used simple names. Names of this type could be honorific or aspirational, or might refer to deities, physical peculiarities, or circumstances of birth. In this early period, the number of personal names must have been quite large, but with the development of additional names the number in widespread use dwindled. By the early Republic, about three dozen Latin prenomena remained in use, some of which were already rare, about eighteen were used by the patricians. Barely a dozen prenomena remained in general use under the empire, although aristocratic families sometimes revived older prenomena, or created new ones from cognomena. The development of the nomen as the second element of the Italic name cannot be attributed to a specific period or culture. From the earliest period it was common to both the Indo-European speaking Italic peoples and the Etruscans. The historian Livy relates the adoption of Silvius as a nomen by the kings of Alba Longa in honor of their ancestor, Silvius. As part of Rome's foundation myth, this statement cannot be regarded as historical fact, but it does indicate the antiquity of the period to which the Romans themselves ascribed the adoption of hereditary surnames. In Latin, most nomina were formed by adding an adjectival suffix, usually ius, to the stem of an existing word or name. Frequently this required a joining element, such as e, id, il, or on. Many common nomina arose as patronymic surnames, for instance, the nomen Marcius was derived from the prenomen Marcus, and originally signified Marci Filius, son of Marcus. In the same way, Sextus, Publilius, and Lucilius arose from the prenomena Sextus, Publius, and Lucius. This demonstrates that, much like later European surnames, the earliest nomina were not necessarily hereditary, but might be adopted and discarded at will, and changed from one generation to the next. The practice from which these patronymics arose also gave rise to the filiation, which in later times, once the nomen had become fixed, nearly always followed the nomen. Other nomina were derived from names that later came to be regarded as cognomena, such as Plancius from Plancus or Flavius from Flavus, or from place names, such as Norbanus from Norba. The binomial name consisting of prenomen and nomen eventually spread throughout Italy. Nomina from different languages and regions often have distinctive characteristics. Latin nomina tended to end in ius, us, aius, ius, eus, or aeus, while Oscan names frequently ended in as or iis, Umbrian names in as, anas, enas, or enas, and Etruscan names in arna, erna, ina, enna, ina, or ina. Oscan and Umbrian forms tend to be found in inscriptions. In Roman literature, these names are often Latinized. Many individuals added an additional surname, or cognomen, which helped to distinguish between members of larger families. Originally these were simply personal names, which might be derived from a person's physical features, personal qualities, occupation, place of origin, or even an object with which a person was associated. Some cognomena were derived from the circumstance of a person's adoption from one family into another, or were derived from foreign names, such as when a freedman received a Roman prenomen and nomen. Other cognomena commemorated important events associated with a person, a battle in which a man had fought Regilensis, a town captured Coriolanus, or a miraculous occurrence Corvus. The late grammarians distinguished certain cognomena as agnomena, although originally a personal name, the cognomen frequently became hereditary, especially in large families, or gentis, in which they served to identify distinct branches, known as stirpes. Some Romans had more than one cognomen, and in aristocratic families it was not unheard of for individuals to have as many as three, of which some might be hereditary and some personal. These surnames were initially characteristic of patrician families, but over time cognomena were also acquired by the plebeians. 
However, a number of distinguished plebeian gentis, such as the Antoni and the Mari, were never divided into different branches, and in these families cognomina were the exception rather than the rule. Cognomina are known from the beginning of the Republic, but were long regarded as informal names, and omitted from most official records before the 2nd century BC. Later inscriptions commemorating the early centuries of the Republic supply these missing surnames, although the authenticity of some of them has been disputed. Under the empire, however, the cognomen acquired great importance, and the number of cognomina assumed by the Roman aristocracy multiplied exponentially. Adding to the complexity of aristocratic names was the practice of combining the full nomenclature of both one's paternal and maternal ancestors, resulting in some individuals appearing to have two or more complete names. Duplicative or politically undesirable names might be omitted, while the order of names might be rearranged to emphasize those giving the bearer the greatest prestige. Following the promulgation of the Constitutio Antoniniana in AD 212, granting Roman citizenship to all free men living within the Roman Empire, the prenomen and nomen lost much of their distinguishing function, as all of the newly enfranchised citizens shared the name of Marcus Aurelius. The prenomen and sometimes the nomen gradually disappeared from view, crowded out by other names indicating the bearer's rank and social connections. Surviving inscriptions from the 5th century rarely provide a citizen's full nomenclature. In the final centuries of the empire, the traditional nomenclature was sometimes replaced by alternate names, known as signa. In the course of the 6th century, as central authority collapsed and Roman institutions disappeared, the complex forms of Roman nomenclature were abandoned altogether, and the people of Italy and Western Europe reverted to single names. Modern European nomenclature developed independently of the Roman model during the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. However, many modern names are derived from Roman originals. Tria nomina. The three types of names that have come to be regarded as quintessentially Roman were the prenomen, nomen, and cognomen. Together, these were referred to as the tria nomina. Although not all Romans possessed three names, the practice of using multiple names having different functions was a defining characteristic of Roman culture that distinguished citizens from foreigners. Topic. Prenomen The prenomen was a true personal name, chosen by a child's parents, and bestowed on the dies lustratius, or day of lustration, a ritual purification performed on the eighth day after the birth of a girl, or the ninth day after the birth of a boy. Normally all of the children in a family would have different prenomena. Although there was no law restricting the use of specific prenomena, the choice of the parents was usually governed by custom and family tradition. An eldest son was usually named after his father, and younger sons were named after their father's brothers or other male ancestors. In this way, the same prenomena were passed down in a family from one generation to the next. Not only did this serve to emphasize the continuity of a family across many generations, but the selection of prenomena also distinguished the customs of one gens from another. The patrician gentis in particular tended to limit the number of prenomena that they used far more than the plebeians, which was a way of reinforcing the exclusiveness of their social status. Of course, there were many exceptions to these general practices. A son might be named in honor of one of his maternal relatives, thus bringing a new name into the gens. Because some gentis made regular use of only three or four prenomena, new names might appear whenever there were several younger sons. Furthermore, a number of the oldest and most influential patrician families made a habit of choosing unusual names, in particular the Fabii, Emilii, Ferri, Claudii, Cornelii, and Valerii all used prenomena that were uncommon amongst the patricians, or which had fallen out of general use. In the last two centuries of the Republic, and under the early Empire, it was fashionable for aristocratic families to revive older prenomena. About three dozen Latin prenomena were in use at the beginning of the Republic, although only about 18 were common. This number fell gradually, until by the 1st century AD, about a dozen prenomena remained in widespread use, with a handful of others used by particular families. The origin and use of prenomena was a matter of curiosity to the Romans themselves. In De Prenominibus, Probus discusses a number of older prenomena and their meanings. Most prenomena were regularly abbreviated, and rarely written in full. Other prenomena were used by the Oscan, Umbrian, and Etruscan-speaking peoples of Italy, and many of these also had regular abbreviations. Lists of prenomena used by the various people of Italy, together with their usual abbreviations, can be found at Prenomen. 
Roman men were usually known by their prenomena to members of their family and household, clientes and close friends, but outside of this circle, they might be called by their nomen, cognomen, or any combination of prenomen, nomen, and cognomen that was sufficient to distinguish them from other men with similar names. In the literature of the Republic, and on all formal occasions, such as when a senator was called upon to speak, it was customary to address a citizen by prenomen and nomen, or, if this were insufficient to distinguish him from other members of the gens, by prenomen and cognomen. In imperial times, the prenomen became increasingly confused by the practices of the aristocracy. The emperors usually prefixed imperator to their names as a prenomen, while at the same time retaining their own prenomena, but because most of the early emperors were legally adopted by their predecessors, and formally assumed new names, even these were subject to change. Several members of the Julio-Claudian dynasty exchanged their original prenomena for cognomena, or received cognomena in place of prenomena at birth. An emperor might emancipate or enfranchise large groups of people at once, all of whom would automatically receive the emperor's prenomen and nomen. Yet another common practice beginning in the first century AD was to give multiple sons the same prenomen, and distinguish them using different cognomena. By the second century, this was becoming the rule, rather than the exception. Another confusing practice was the addition of the full nomenclature of maternal ancestors to the basic tria nomina, so that a man might appear to have two prenomena, one occurring in the middle of his name. Under the weight of these practices and others, the utility of the prenomen to distinguish between men continued to decline, until only the force of tradition prevented its utter abandonment. Over the course of the 3rd century, prenomena become increasingly scarce in written records, and from the 4th century onward their appearance becomes exceptional. The descendants of those who had been granted citizenship by the Constitutio Antoniniana seem to have dispensed with prenomena altogether, and by the end of the Western Empire, only the oldest Roman families continued to use them. <laughs> nomen The nomen gentilicium, or gentile name, designated a Roman citizen as a member of a gens. A gens, which may be translated as race family, or clan, constituted an extended Roman family, all of whom shared the same nomen, and claimed descent from a common ancestor. Particularly in the early Republic, the gens functioned as a state within the state, observing its own sacred rights, and establishing private laws, which were binding on its members, although not on the community as a whole. Topic. Cognomen The cognomen, the third element of the tria nomina, began as an additional personal name. It was not unique to Rome, but Rome was where the cognomen flourished, as the development of the gens and the gradual decline of the prenomen as a useful means of distinguishing between individuals made the cognomen a useful means of identifying both individuals and whole branches of Rome's leading families. In the early years of the Republic, some aristocratic Romans had as many as three cognomena, some of which were hereditary, while others were personal, like the nomen. Cognomena could arise from any number of factors, personal characteristics, habits, occupations, places of origin, heroic exploits, and so forth. One class of cognomena consisted largely of archaic prenomena that were seldom used by the later Republic, although as cognomena these names persisted throughout imperial times. Many cognomena had unusual terminations for Latin names, ending in a, o, or io, and their meanings were frequently obscure, even in antiquity. This seems to emphasize the manner in which many cognomena originally arose from nicknames. The ius termination typical of Latin nomina was generally not used for cognomena until the 4th century AD, making it easier to distinguish between nomina and cognomena until the final centuries of the Western Empire. Unlike the nomen, which was passed down unchanged from father to son, cognomena could appear and disappear almost at will. They were not normally chosen by the persons who bore them, but were earned or bestowed by others, which may account for the wide variety of unflattering names that were used as cognomena. Doubtless some cognomena were used ironically, while others continued in use largely because, whatever their origin, they were useful for distinguishing among individuals and between branches of large families. New cognomena were coined and came into fashion throughout Roman history. Under the Empire, the number of cognomena increased dramatically. Where once only the most noble patrician houses used multiple surnames, Romans of all backgrounds and social standing might bear several cognomena. By the 3rd century, this had become the norm amongst freeborn Roman citizens. 
The question of how to classify different cognomena led the grammarians of the 4th and 5th centuries to designate some of them as agnomena. For most of the Republic, the usual manner of distinguishing individuals was through the binomial form of prenomen and nomen. But as the prenomen lost its value as a distinguishing name, and gradually faded into obscurity, its former role was assumed by the versatile cognomen, and the typical manner of identifying individuals came to be by nomen and cognomen. Essentially, one form of binomial nomenclature was replaced by another, over the course of several centuries. The very lack of regularity that allowed the cognomen to be used as either a personal or a hereditary surname became its strength in imperial times. As a hereditary surname, a cognomen could be used to identify an individual's connection with other noble families, either by descent, or later by association. Individual cognomena could also be used to distinguish between members of the same family, even as siblings came to share the same prenomen, they bore different cognomena, some from the paternal line, and others from their maternal ancestors. Although the nomen was a required element of Roman nomenclature down to the end of the Western Empire, its usefulness as a distinguishing name declined throughout imperial times, as an increasingly large portion of the population bore nomina such as Flavius or Aurelius, which had been granted en masse to newly enfranchised citizens. As a result, by the 3rd century the cognomen became the most important element of the Roman name, and frequently the only one that was useful for distinguishing between individuals. In the later empire, the proliferation of cognomena was such that the full nomenclature of most individuals was not recorded, and in many cases the only names surviving in extant records are cognomena. By the 6th century, traditional Roman cognomena were frequently prefixed by a series of names with Christian religious significance. As Roman institutions vanished, and the distinction between nomen and cognomen ceased to have any practical importance, the complex system of cognomena that developed under the later empire faded away. The people of the Western Empire reverted to single names, which were indistinguishable from the cognomena that they replaced. Many former prenomena and nomena also survived in this way. Agnomen The proliferation of cognomena in the later centuries of the empire led some grammarians to classify certain types as agnomena. This class included two main types of cognomen, the cognomen ex virtute, and cognomena that were derived from nomina, to indicate the parentage of Romans who had been adopted from one gens into another. Although these names had existed throughout Roman history, it was only in this late period that they were distinguished from other cognomena. Cognomena ex virtute The cognomen ex virtute was a surname derived from some virtuous or heroic episode attributed to the bearer. Roman history is filled with individuals who obtained cognomena as a result of their exploits. Aulus Postumius Albus Regulensis, who commanded the Roman army at the Battle of Lake Regillus, Gnaeus Marcius Coriolanus, who captured the city of Corioli, Marcus Valerius Corvus, who defeated a giant Gaul in single combat, aided by a raven, Titus Manlius Torquatus, who likewise defeated a Gaulish giant, and took his name from the torque that he claimed as a prize, Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus, who carried the Second Punic War to Africa. Africa, and defeated Hannibal. Ironically, the most famous examples of this class of cognomen come from the period of the Republic, centuries before the concept of the agnomen was formulated. <laughs> Adoptive cognomena Adoption was a common and formal process in Roman culture. Its chief purpose had nothing to do with providing homes for children, it was about ensuring the continuity of family lines that might otherwise become extinct. In early Rome, this was especially important for the patricians, who enjoyed tremendous status and privilege compared with the plebeians. Because few families were admitted to the patriciate after the expulsion of the kings, while the number of plebeians continually grew, the patricians continually struggled to preserve their wealth and influence. A man who had no sons to inherit his property and preserve his family name would adopt one of the younger sons from another family. In time, as the plebeians also acquired wealth and gained access to the offices of the Roman state, they too came to participate in the Roman system of adoption, since the primary purpose of adoption was to preserve the name and status of the adopter. An adopted son would usually assume both the prenomen and nomen of his adoptive father, together with any hereditary cognomena, just as an eldest son would have done. However, adoption did not result in the complete abandonment of the adopted son's birth name. The son's original nomen or occasionally cognomen would become the basis of a new surname, formed by adding the derivative suffix anus or enus to the stem. 
Thus, when a son of Lucius Aemilius Paulus was adopted by Publius Cornelius Scipio, he became Publius Cornelius Scipio Aemilianus. In his will, the dictator Gaius Julius Caesar adopted his grandnephew, Gaius Octavius, who became known as Gaius Julius Caesar Octavianus. Topic. Filiation Apart from the prenomen, the filiation was the oldest element of the Roman name. Even before the development of the nomen as a hereditary surname, it was customary to use the name of a person's father as a means of distinguishing him or her from others with the same personal name, thus Lucius, the son of Marcus would be Lucius, Marci Filius, Paula, the daughter of Quintus, would be Paula, Quinti Filia. Many nomina were derived in the same way, and most prenomina have at least one corresponding nomen, such as Lucilius, Marcius, Publilius, Quinctius, or Servilius. These are known as patronymic surnames, because they are derived from the name of the original bearer's father. Even after the development of the nomen and cognomen, filiation remained a useful means of distinguishing between members of a large family. Filiations were normally written between the nomen and any cognomena, and abbreviated using the typical abbreviations for prenomena, followed by f, for filius or filia, and sometimes n, for nepos grandson or neptis granddaughter. Thus, the inscription s postumius af. p. n. albus regilensis means, spurius postumius albus regilensis, of Aulus the son, of Publius the grandson. Tiberius Aemilius Mamercinus, the son of Lucius and grandson of Mamercus, would be written T. Aemilius L.F. Mam. N. Mamercinus. The more formal the writing, the more generations might be included. A great grandchild would be Pron, or Pronep, for Pronepos or Proneptes, a great great grandchild Abn, or Abnep, for Abnepos or Abneptis, and a great 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 grandchild Adnepos or Adneptes. However, these forms are rarely included as part of a name, except on the grandest of monumental inscriptions. The filiations sometimes included the name of the mother, in which case Natus would follow the mother's name, instead of Filius or Filia. This is especially common in families of Etruscan origin. The names of married women were sometimes followed by the husband's name in Uxor for wife. N. Fabius Qf. M. N. Furia Natus Maximus means. Numerius Fabius Maximus, son of Quintus, grandson of Marcus, born of Furia, while Claudia L. Valeri Uxor would be Claudia, wife of Lucius Valerius. Slaves and freedmen also possessed filiations, although in this case the person referred to is usually the slave's owner, rather than his or her father. The abbreviations here include S, for service or serva and L, for libertus or liberta. A slave might have more than one owner, in which case the names could be given serially. In some cases the owner's nomen or cognomen was used instead of or in addition to the prenomen. The liberty of women sometimes used an inverted C, signifying the feminine prenomen Gaia, here used generically to mean any woman, and there are a few examples of an inverted M. Although it is not clear whether this was used generically, or specifically for the feminine prenomen Marca or Marcia, an example of the filiation of slaves and freedmen would be, Alexander Corneli Els, Alexander, slave of Lucius Cornelius, who upon his emancipation would probably become L. Cornelius LL. Alexander, Lucius Cornelius Alexander, freedman of Lucius. It was customary for a freedman to take the prenomen of his former owner, if he did not already have one, and to use his original personal name as a cognomen. Another example might be Salvia Pompeia C.N. L. Salvia Pompeia, freedwoman of Gnaeus Pompeius and Gaia. Here Gaia is used generically, irrespective of whether Pompeius' wife was actually named Gaia. A freedman of the emperor might have the filiation August, L. Augusti Libertus. Although filiation was common throughout the history of the Republic and well into imperial times, no law governed its use or inclusion in writing. It was used by custom and for convenience, but could be ignored or discarded, as it suited the needs of the writer. Tribe From the beginning of the Roman Republic, all citizens were enumerated in one of the tribes making up the Comitia Tributa, or tribal assembly. This was the most democratic of Rome's three main legislative assemblies of the Roman Republic, in that all citizens could participate on an equal basis, without regard to wealth or social status. Over time, its decrees, known as plebiscita, or plebiscites, 
became binding on the whole Roman people. Although much of the assembly's authority was usurped by the emperors, membership in a tribe remained an important part of Roman citizenship, so that the name of the tribe came to be incorporated into a citizen's full nomenclature. The number of tribes varied over time. Tradition ascribed the institution of thirty tribes to Servius Tullius, the sixth king of Rome, but ten of these were destroyed at the beginning of the Republic. Several tribes were added between 387 and 241 BC, as large swaths of Italy came under Roman control, bringing the total number of tribes to 35. Except for a brief experiment at the end of the Social War in 88 BC, this number remained fixed. The nature of the tribes was mainly geographic, rather than ethnic. Inhabitants of Rome were, in theory, assigned to one of the four urban tribes, while the territory beyond the city was allocated to the rural or Rustic tribes. Geography was not the sole determining factor in one's tribus. At times, efforts were made to assign freedmen to the four urban tribes, thus concentrating their votes and limiting their influence on the comitia tributa. Perhaps for similar reasons, when large numbers of provincials gained the franchise, certain rural tribes were preferred for their enrollment. Citizens did not normally change tribes when they moved from one region to another, but the censors had the power to punish a citizen by expelling him from one of the rural tribes and assigning him to one of the urban tribes. In later periods, most citizens were enrolled in tribes without respect to geography, precisely when it became common to include the name of a citizen's tribus as part of his full nomenclature as uncertain. The name of the tribe normally follows the filiation and precedes any cognomena, suggesting that it occurred before the cognomen was recognized as a formal part of the Roman name, so probably no later than the 2nd century BC. However, in both writing and inscriptions, the tribus is found with much less frequency than other parts of the name, so the custom of including it does not seem to have been deeply ingrained in Roman practice. As with the filiation, it was common to abbreviate the name of the tribe. For the names of the 35 tribes and their abbreviations, see Roman tribe. Topic. Women's names In the earliest period, the binomial nomenclature of prenomen and nomen that developed throughout Italy was shared by both men and women. Most prenomena had both masculine and feminine forms, and a number of prenomena common to women were seldom or never used by men. Just as men's prenomena, women's names were regularly abbreviated instead of being written in full. A list of women's prenomena can be found at prenomen. But for a variety of reasons, women's prenomena became neglected over the course of Roman history, and by the end of the Republic, most women did not have or did not use prenomena. They did not disappear entirely, nor were Roman women bereft of personal names, but for most of Roman history women were known chiefly by their nomina or cognomena. The first of these reasons is probably that the prenomen itself lost much of its original utility following the adoption of hereditary surnames. The number of prenomena commonly used by both men and women declined throughout Roman history. For men, who might hold public office or serve in the military, the prenomen remained an important part of the legal name. But, as in other ancient societies, Roman women played little role in public life, so the factors that resulted in the continuation of men's prenomena did not exist for women. Another factor was probably that the prenomen was not usually necessary to distinguish between women within the family. Because a Roman woman did not change her nomen when she married, her nomen alone was usually sufficient to distinguish her from every other member of the family. As Latin names had distinctive masculine and feminine forms, the nomen was sufficient to distinguish a daughter from both of her parents and all of her brothers. Thus, there was no need for a personal name unless there were multiple sisters in the same household. When this occurred, prenomena could be and frequently were used to distinguish between sisters. However, it was also common to identify sisters using a variety of names, some of which could be used as either prenomena or cognomena. For example, if Publius Servilius had two daughters, they would typically be referred to as Servilia Major and Servilia Minor. If there were more daughters, the eldest might be called Servilia Prima or Servilia Maxima, younger daughters as Servilia Secunda, Tertia, Quarta, etc. All of these names could be used as prenomena, preceding the nomen, but common usage from the later republic onward was to treat them as personal cognomena. When these names appear in either position, it is frequently impossible to determine whether they were intended as prenomena or cognomena. Although women's prenomena were infrequently used in the later republic, they continued to be used, when needed, into imperial times. Among the other peoples of Italy, women's prenomena continued to be used regularly until the populace was thoroughly Romanized. 
In the Etruscan culture, where women held a markedly higher social status than at Rome or in other ancient societies, inscriptions referring to women nearly always include prenomena. Most Roman women were known by their nomina, with such distinction as described above for older and younger siblings. If further distinction were needed, she could be identified as a particular citizen's daughter or wife. For instance, Cicero refers to a woman as Annia P. Anni Senatoris Filia, which means, Annia, daughter of Publius Annius, the senator. However, toward the end of the Republic, as hereditary cognomena came to be regarded as proper names, a woman might be referred to by her cognomen instead, or by a combination of nomen and cognomen. The daughter of Lucius Cecilius Metellus was usually referred to as Cecilia Metella. Sometimes these cognomena were given diminutive forms, such as Agrippina from the masculine Agrippa, or Drusilla from Drusus. In imperial times, other, less formal names were sometimes used to distinguish between women with similar names. Still later, Roman women, like men, adopted signa, or alternative names, in place of their Roman names. With the fall of the Western Empire in the 5th century, the last traces of the distinctive Italic nomenclature system began to disappear, and women too reverted to single names. <laughs> Foreign names As Roman territory expanded beyond Italy, many foreigners obtained Roman citizenship, and adopted Roman names. Often these were discharged auxiliary soldiers, or the leaders of annexed towns and peoples. Customarily a newly enfranchised citizen would adopt the prenomen and nomen of his patron, that is, the person who had adopted or manumitted him, or otherwise procured his citizenship. But many such individuals retained a portion of their original names, usually in the form of cognomena. This was especially true for citizens of Greek origin. A name such as T. Flavius Aristodemus or Gaius Julius Hyginus would be typical of such persons, although in form these names are not distinguishable from those of freedmen. The Constitutio Antoniniana promulgated by Caracalla in AD 212 was perhaps the most far reaching of many imperial decrees enfranchising large numbers of non citizens living throughout the empire. It extended citizenship to all free inhabitants of the empire, all of whom thus received the name Marcus Aurelius, after the emperor's prenomen and nomen. The result was that vast numbers of individuals who had never possessed prenomena or nomina formally shared the same names. In turn, many of the New Romans promptly discarded their prenomena, and ignored their nomina except when required by formality. As a result, the cognomena adopted by these citizens, often including their original non-Latin names, became the most important part of their nomenclature. Topic: <inaudible> Imperial names. During the Republic, a person's names were usually static and predictable, unless he were adopted into a new family or obtained a new surname. In imperial times, however, names became highly variable and subject to change. Perhaps no names were more variable than those of the emperors. For example, the first emperor, known conventionally as Augustus, began life as C. Octavius C.F., or Gaius Octavius, the son of Gaius Octavius. His ancestors had borne the same name for at least four generations. Although the Octavii were an old and distinguished plebeian family, the gens was not divided into stirpes and had no hereditary cognomena. Octavius' father had put down a slave revolt at Thurii and was sometimes given the surname Thurinus, a cognomen ex virtute, but this name was not passed down to the son. At the age of 18 in 44 BC, Octavius was nominated magister equitum by his granduncle, Gaius Julius Caesar, who held the office of dictator. On the Ides of March, Caesar was assassinated, without legitimate children, but in his will he adopted his nephew, who then became C. Julius C.F. Caesar Octavianus. Gaius Julius Caesar Octavianus, son of Gaius. Thus far, his name follows the Republican model, becoming that of his adoptive father, followed by his original nomen in the form of an agnomen. Two years later, Caesar was deified by the Roman Senate, and Octavian, as he was then known, was styled D.V.F. Son of the Divine Caesar. Instead of C.F., still later, after having been acclaimed imperator by the troops under his command, Octavian assumed this title as an additional prenomen, becoming imp. C. Julius D.V.F. Caesar Octavianus, in some inscriptions his original prenomen is discarded altogether. In 27 BC, the Senate granted him the title of Augustus, which would ever after be affixed as a cognomen to the names of the Roman emperors. 
A similar pattern was followed by Augustus' heirs. The emperor's stepson and eventual successor was born Tiberius Claudius Nero. After his adoption by the emperor, he became Tiberius Julius Caesar, retaining his original prenomen. His brother, born Decimus Claudius Nero, subsequently became Nero Claudius Drusus, exchanging his original prenomen for his paternal cognomen, and assuming a new cognomen from his maternal grandfather. Other members of the Julio Claudian dynasty used prenomenas such as Drusus and Germanicus. In subsequent generations, all reigning emperors assumed imperator as an additional prenomen, usually without foregoing their original prenomena, and Augustus as a cognomen. Caesar came to be used as a cognomen designating an heir apparent, and for the first two centuries of the empire, most emperors were adopted by their predecessors. The result was that each emperor bore a series of names that had more to do with the previous emperor than the names with which he had been born. They added new cognomena as they fought and conquered enemies and new lands, and their filiations recorded their descent from a series of gods. As the names of the emperors themselves changed, so did the names of the members of their families. Later development During the empire, superficially the naming conventions appear to dissolve into anarchy. In fact, this was not the case, new conventions developed, which were themselves internally coherent. <laughs> Binary nomenclature and polyonymy Under the High Empire the new aristocracy began adopting two or more nomina, a practice which has been termed binary nomenclature. This arose out of a desire to incorporate distinguished maternal ancestry in a name or, in order to inherit property, an heir was required by a will to incorporate the testator's name into his own name. For example, the suffect consul of AD 118 9, Gaius Brutius Presens Lucius Fulvius Rusticus, has a name which is composed of two standard sets of tria nomina, he was the natural son of a Lucius Brutius, and added the nomina of his maternal grandfather, Lucius Fulvius Rusticus, to his paternal nomina, in order to reflect an illustrious pedigree or other connections, the aristocracy expanded the binary nomenclature concept to include other nomina from an individual's paternal and maternal ancestry. There was no limit to the number of names which could be added in this way known as polyonymy, and, for example, the consul of 169 AD, usually called Q. Socius Priscus had 38 names comprising 14 sets of nomina reflecting a complex pedigree stretching back three generations. <laughs> Cognomen replaces prenomen. The prenomen, even under the classic system, had never been particularly distinctive because of the limited number of prenomena available. Between the late Republic and the 2nd century AD, the prenomen gradually became less used and eventually disappeared altogether. Even among the senatorial aristocracy it became a rarity by about 300 AD. In part this came about through a tendency for the same prenomen to be given to all males of a family, thereby fossilizing a particular prenomen, nomen combination and making the prenomen even less distinctive e.g. all males in the Emperor Vespasian's family including all his sons had the prenomen, nomen combination Titus Flavius Grandfather, Titus Flavius Petro Father, Titus Flavius Sabinus married Vespasia Poia Elder brother, Titus Flavius Sabinus, whose son was Titus Flavius Sabinus and grandsons were Titus Flavius Sabinus and Titus Flavius Clemens. Titus Flavius Vespasianus, emperor, known as Vespasianus married Flavia Domitilla Eldest son, Titus Flavius Vespasianus, emperor, known as Titus Youngest son, Titus Flavius Domitianus, emperor, known as Domitianus the cognomen, as in Vespasian's family, then assumed the distinguishing function for individuals. Where this happened, the cognomen replaced the prenomen in intimate address. The result was that two names remained in use for formal public address but instead of prenomen plus nomen, it became nomen plus cognomen. Topic. Constitutio Antoniniana With the Constitutio Antoniniana in 212, the Emperor Caracalla granted Roman citizenship to all free inhabitants of the Empire. It had long been the expectation that when a non-Roman acquired citizenship he, as part of his enfranchisement, took on a Roman name. With the mass enfranchisement of 212, the new citizens adopted the nomen Aurelius 
In recognition of Caracalla's beneficence, the emperor's full name was Marcus Aurelius Severus Antoninus Augustus, with Aurelius as the nomen. Aurelius quickly became the most common nomen in the East and the second most common after Julius in the West. The change in the origins of the new governing elite that assumed control of the empire from the end of the 3rd century can be seen in their names. Seven of the thirteen emperors between Gallienus and Diocletian bore the name Marcus Aurelius, although prenomena were not adopted by the new citizens, reflecting the pre existing decline amongst old Romans. In the West, the new names were formulated on the same basis as the existing Roman practices. In the East, however, the new citizens formulated their names by placing Aurelius, before versions of their non-Roman given name and a patronymic. Ultimately, the ubiquity of Aurelius meant that it could not function as a true distinguishing nomen, and became primarily just a badge of citizenship added to any name. Topic. Traditional nomen replaced Although a nomen would long be required for official purposes, and, in isolated corners of the empire and in parts of Italy, its usage would persist into the 7th century, the nomen was generally omitted from the name even of emperors by the 3rd century, two factors encouraged its frequent non-use. Firstly, the cognomen increasingly became the distinguishing name and general name of address. As a result, New Romans, and, under their influence, Old Romans, Two, either dropped the nomen from their name or, in some cases, treated the nomen as a prenomen. Secondly, with the nomen becoming an increasingly fossilized formality, non Italian families, even those who had acquired citizenship and a nomen prior to 212, began to ignore their nomen. When a nomen was required for official purposes, they would simply put the default nomen of Aurelius in front of their name, rather than use their actual nomen. Topic. See also Prenomen Cognomen Agnomen Latinization of names Ancient Greek personal names Topic Notes Topic References Topic Bibliography Topic. External links Roman names Names of Byzantine Romans in Turkish